the Spirit of Jazz podcast, where music dances with mystery, with your hosts, Bill Carter and Jeff Kellum. Welcome back to the Spirit of Jazz podcast. This is Bill Carter. And I'm Jeff Kellum. It's an exciting time. I'm thinking about the release of your book. Oh, it's coming up. Thriving on a Riff, Jazz and the Spiritual Life. Comes out April 2024 with Broadleaf Books. That's great. And that'll be available, of course, online and at your local bookstores. But for the audience, maybe we ought to talk a little bit about how this book explores jazz and the spiritual life, whatever that is, or however you define it. Yeah. It's a book about the uh, explorations and connections I've been making for a long time, starting really with the whole question of what makes music spiritual or potentially makes it spiritual? And what exactly is spirit? You know, I don't know. (laughs) I think the better word might be soul, you know, that breathing part of our being that animates our thinking and our acting. And, you know, I totally avoid the word spirituality because I don't know what that means either. It's blurry, isn't it? It is. It's an ality word. I'm more interested in what gives us life and what gives us vitality in its abundance and how this will push us beyond the ways that we've become hardened or bitter or damaged. So as we read the book, are we looking at what we can learn from jazz and applying that to our spiritual practices, whatever they may be? Sure, but this is not really a how-to book. My greater concern is how music and listening to it and creating it, how all of that can be a spiritual practice and what that suggests for how we live. I want to get under to the shallow surface and into the depths, which is why a good part of the book is writing about creativity. Originally, that was going to be one chapter, but the more I got into it, I realized there's divine creativity and there's human creativity, and I had to discuss both and how they intersect. You know, recently I was talking with a musician in the jazz club, and, you know, he kind of had everything parceled out. He said, have a good day keep working for God. I'm not (laughs) sure what he meant. (laughs) Was he being sarcastic? I can't say, but I started to wonder, is God present in the nightclub? And in what sense would that be true? Uh, What kind of God are we talking about? Uh, Obviously, the God that creates, not merely the God who created past tense, but God in the present tense. And if you lay that reality beside the notion of jazz as a creative and evolving tradition, Uh, It's easy to make a case for evolution without ever using that word. Yeah, yeah. When I think of the creator or or the source, I'm thinking of like inspiration, inspiring, a breathing, just breathing. You take spirituality or spirit or inspiration. That's what moves me into a life of the spirit. I understand that. And it's here and now. It's not that reductive notion that the whole aim of the spiritual life is to get us into heaven. For almost 40 years as a pastor, I can only speculate about heaven. I have hopes for it. In the last chapter of the book, I point to eternity and endless love and endless joy. But the goal of life is not to get into heaven. The goal of life, I think, is to live. Yeah, and and to live abundantly. I remember that quote from the scriptures, but I also remember a poster on the wall of a youth center where I worked, quoting uh, one of the, well, we used to call them church fathers. Oh, the one from Irenaeus. Yeah. Yeah. St. Irenaeus. The the glory of God is in the person who is completely alive. Yes. And I, I think about what, so what does this mean? Is it open to love, given and received? Is it Like Thomas Merton, who had the vision one day in a street corner that he loved everybody. (laughs) And what does that look like in a world defined by brokenness or fractured by racism? And what does that mean then to live abundantly? I, I struggle with this, Jeff, in light of a jazz tradition. There are a lot of great jazz musicians whose lives were consumed by bad habits, drugs. Yes. And in spite of all this, there's something deeply alive within them that kept them creating. I love that tension about being broken and beautiful. Yeah. 
Some people speak of a, a God-shaped hole within us, which we attempt to fill with substitutes, and we become dependent on them. I think there is a hole like that, and it comes with a homing beacon. You mean a sense of calling, calling us home? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I remember growing up with uh, preacher stories of people who heard a, a voice and were suddenly converted. I never had that experience. I, I was nurtured in the church, born and raised there. I took it seriously. Mm -hmm. I had what I used to call as a kid a God consciousness, a combination of call and experiences with, I don't know, doors opening and windows closing. Unfortunately, the media culture has created showbiz preachers and sold religion as a consumable product. Yeah, I'm reflecting, too, on a very recent podcast of ours where the pianist Bill Mays was saying he was always cultivating beauty and always seeking it out in everything and all that he did. And I think there's that homing beacon. Yeah. The lie of all this is uh, the assumption that when you have such a moment, you're finished and you're completed. And the jazz tradition makes it clear you are never finished. The music is bigger than you. You know, as a composer, the composition is never finished. It's performed and changed and yeah. transformed. Well, it's launched. Yeah, yeah <laughs> It's good. launched. It's set in, into motion. And then what the musicians bring, that's where the fun is. Yeah. And the only way forward is forward. You know, my own story is that I fell in love with the music. I wanted to learn how to get around in it. And at first, I didn't have anybody to teach me. My first piano teacher was a saintly farmer's wife who lived out in the country and taught me scales and hand positions. She introduced me to the classics, but I started to believe that Bach could have written other notes than the ones that ended up on paper. And that's how I began to play his music. And she was mortified. And it was that moment she said, you know, I can't teach you anymore. And well, I found another teacher, a guy named Lenny. Um, who sent me on a trajectory of musical growth. And pretty soon, you know, my friends had rock bands in their garages. I had a jazz quintet in my parents' basement. <laughs> but I'll bet you were just as loud as they were and uh, making, I think, m certainly more beautiful music. Well, <laughs> we were just as loud. Uh, and I began college as a pre-med major, which was an ill-advised choice. And as that came unraveled, I had a couple of spiritual moments of thought, well, maybe being a pastor is what I should do. Yet I had to deal with all those, um, you know, sacred and secular splits that I write about in the book. And people were saying, you know, you can't do this. You can't play jazz and be a Christian pastor. Uh, it just doesn't fit. I even had a guy in a college Bible study who was horrified to discover I had boxes of jazz LPs. And he wanted to start a bonfire. And I'm not making this up. <laughs> Boom. Man, that's just, I can imagine Miles Davis going up in flames and uh, Duke Ellington. And uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. How narrow. Well, how narrow. And in that position, there's no love, no grace, no humanity, no creativity. And that's when I began to figure out my calling. Mm. I thought I had to give up music. And I even tried to do that for a while, except the jazz kept rebounding, even when I went to Princeton Seminary. Yeah. We had a speech department that produced shows, and they found out I played, and they grabbed me to play for the shows. And I know I was the only person in Alexander Hall, the dormitory, who had a Fender Rose electric piano and the collective works of Miles Davis on the shelf. <laughs> And even then, it took uh, almost a decade to figure out uh, how it might all fit together until the moment came uh, in my second church where a man stood up to say, we want to hear you play something. That was the beginning, and it's been rolling downhill ever since. <laughs> well, speaking of hearing you play something, why don't we take a break and listen to some, some music? Let's do it.
Okay, Bill, new topic. Say something more about suffering. We had referenced that a little bit earlier. Let's let's okay. flesh that out a little bit. Well, it, it occurs to me that the music that begins in suffering is the music that can best address the suffering. I remember a friend took me to a blues concert. The band is up there wailing and the singers belting out one about a lost love, and the music reached an emotional apex. And my friend turned to me and said, doesn't this feel good? Mm. We laughed. We were listening to the blues. And what's that about? You know, these days I wonder why white audiences in the 30s, 40s, 50s went to hear Billie Holiday, especially if they knew she was going to sing that song about lynching, Strange Fruit. Yeah. Was she dressing a wound or lancing a boil? Uh, it certainly didn't fix her. I mean, there's a mystery here, which for me is analogous to the cross of Jesus. Something very painful has the potency to redeem. You know, as you as you say this, it makes me think of the spirituals, uh, which were sung by people in the fields or or back at their homes after working so hard for the slave owners who overheard the music but knew nothing of the depth of the message being sung. And just imagine if those slaveholders had gone to church and heard the slaves singing spirituals. They they didn't know the message behind the songs. They're, no. they're only thinking, aren't these voices pretty? Well, that's true. And here they were uh, bring, importing their Scottish preachers or whoever to to preach about Moses and uh, the right. enslaved folks are singing about Moses saying, let my people go. I mean, it was all code language in the intersection between real life, oppression, and Bible stories. Mm. You know, it's kind of how the book of Revelation was written in code to talk about the oppression of the Roman Empire in a way that the empire wouldn't know it. Americans have tried to reduce that book into a bus schedule for the end of the world um, <laughs> yeah. in which they take an escalator into heaven and everybody else is destroyed. And it's all about spiritual success for those who are hip. But they're totally missing the mystery of the cross. Yeah. So you read that chapter I wrote about racism. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, painful. Yeah, it is. Uh, I was profoundly moved. Uh, I had read a book by James Cone, the theologian, called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. He pointed out the irony of white Christendom, that their faith was rooted in a man who was hung on a tree. And our painful racial history in this nation has often ignored that, uh, destroying people by putting them on trees as a way of lifting themselves up in the name of the one who was hung on a tree. Hmm. And Christian faith has often been reduced to a success story, the kind of success that ignores injustice and blesses consumption. You know, I, I find myself being challenged, especially by that uh, chapter. You challenge us uh, in your writing and, and telling these stories. And, and I'm grateful that you've not written some simplified prescription as if to say, here are the eight steps toward incorporating jazz into your spiritual life. Uh, it's a, there's more depth than that. That's right. And there are not eight steps. And it's not about holding your hands a certain way or learning a proper posture for prayer. If the spiritual life is informed by the jazz life, it'll be all about formation. And I think we're missing that sometimes. Uh, abundant life is about the way that we are shaped to live in the presence of Christ abundantly. Mm. I remember uh, many, many years ago when I discovered that the Roman Catholic Church was using the word formation when we were calling it Christian education. Mm -hmm. And Christian formation, though, is, is deeper, I think, than mere teaching learning, because we're never fully, completely formed. So this idea of always moving, always expanding, always being open, always reinterpreting. Mm -hmm and being available then to go to take the next steps. Without knowing what the next step is. Uh, yeah, that sounds like jazz, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, the conviction of your whole being is then an orientation to growth, and we can't presume we're ever at the final step or ever attained perfection. 
praying, for instance. Praying is so much more than begging for things, particularly if you're not invested in seeing those things through. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, prayer is as much an orientation as it is a request. And then we hear these horrific stories, like the story of the four little girls in Birmingham who were bombed on their way from Sunday school to the sanctuary. Yeah, you know that biblical phrase, the, the spirit groans within us. We have no words. Well, that's right. And our groan is an echo of that deeper groan. And we have to decide what we're going to do. I mean, God's not going to fix everything on this side of the Jordan River without our participation. And at the same time, there are those who have prayed that pain, like John Coltrane, who wrote the composition Alabama, referencing that tragedy and pointing both to the sorrow, but to the hope that transcends it. Yeah, I believe all of God's creatures and creation will be ultimately fixed, but we sure aren't there yet. No. The spirit groans and the musical instruments groan too, I think. Uh, I think of your bass player beating out a, a rhythm and then he pulls out the bow and makes the bass groan. What a visceral sound. Yeah. And it's not the only instrument that can groan, of course, and express these deep feelings within. And just when you think you've figured out what he is doing, He'll then turn the bow on its side and push it and extend it and go deeper and go wider because he will not be reduced by anyone's settled assumptions, Right, which is another key to understanding this extraordinary jazz tradition. We don't merely play what someone has played before. We bring it forward in time, here and now, for the people in front of us and their time and their circumstances. And that is risky. Yeah, it's not like going to a concert where the rock band plays their three-minute hit exactly as it was on the recording, note for note, so that we'll we'll recognize it and accept it. Uh, Jazz opens things up, doesn't it? It does. And if you look closely at that rock concert, a lot of those musicians are wearing wireless earbuds. They're playing with a click track, so it sounds exactly like the recording. It's all pre-programmed. So, uh, you know, why not stay home, save a $100 ticket, and listen there? What I like about jazz, what I love about it in its purest form, is that it isn't an act. It's grounded, it's real, it's completely authentic. For the most authentic sound, yes, but there are some prima donnas. There are some people who live off their personalities and and don't give of themselves from the heart every time they perform, right? Well, that's true. And, you know, when musicians become financially successful, which doesn't happen frequently, (laughs) they often become detached from reality. And I decided pretty early I was not interested in hiring or hearing a saxophonist who had moose in his hair. (laughs) Well, and I don't want to hear some preacher who spent $400 on a haircut either. (laughs) No, nor should you. (laughs) In this book, I try to look beneath the surface of the music. I try to describe the process and what happens to the people who make it. And how does this reflect holy creativity? How is there forward movement, not only in the jazz tradition, but in the souls who participate in it? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about spiritual practices, they are really portals into the divine, but they are not quite the thing itself. No, they, they are the verbs. Oh, yes. Well stated. And I want to push against any kind of individualized notion that if I become a jazz musician, I automatically then become spiritual. No. Uh, Let's pay attention to the jazz musicians. What are they doing? And then explore what it means to deepen our souls and enlarge our hearts. You know, I think more than once in the book, you write that jazz music is, is alive and free, never fixed. And that says a lot to me in terms of my spiritual life, because my spiritual life can't be static. Uh, then it's then it dies. I agree. And I can't count how many books I started to read with the best of intentions, thinking this will be the one book that will lift me up, and I'll get two-thirds of the way through and stop. Uh, you know, is that my own boredom? Maybe I need something more than a book. I've not written a book, but I, I used to write in a journal, it was good for a couple of years, and, and I stopped. 
Others have a quiet time for spiritual reading every day, right after breakfast, and then that dries up. Maybe instead of this, we could listen to music for half an hour to build the spirit within. That would be time well spent. It is one way to tap into the power of creativity, uh, to be lifted to a, a lightness or a fullness of spirit. Well, that's the definition of joy, right? Exactly. Even though jazz emerges from suffering, it is irrepressible. Oh, good word. I like that word. I don't think we can kill jazz, just as I don't think we can kill freedom. Hmm. Uh, there can be repression and negligence and neglect, but I don't think we can actually kill freedom, which gives me enormous hope. A lot of critics declare jazz has a 3% market share, if that. Hmm. And they also point out that Protestant churches like mine are getting smaller. Uh, I smile and quote Jesus. He said, we are the yeast, not the loaf. Hmm. Those small grains of yeast will raise the loaf. That little mustard seed is the one that actually grows. So let's live forward and see what this means. And the little bit I know about church history, whenever the church flourished socially, whenever it was respected, Whenever there was a sermon synopsis printed in Monday's New York Times, those were the times when the church was in danger of losing its soul. The moment when jazz has been in danger of losing its soul is you know, when it has become commercially viable. Yeah, you can, you can see that with popular music when it becomes a product. When jazz has been a product, it has been consumable and ultimately dismissible. Jazz functions better as a verb than a noun. Good jazz tells a nonverbal truth. It models freedom. It models collaboration. It breathes vitality. And those who play it are not afraid of where the music is going or how the life of the spirit will unfold. You know, throughout your book, uh, you're, you have some wonderful quotations from jazz musicians and, and writers about jazz. Um, you want to pick a couple of those just to share as, as this Spirit of Jazz podcast comes to an end? Well, sure. Uh, here's one from John Coltrane, patron saint of the jazz community. He said near the end of his life, my goal is to live the truly religious life and express it in my music. If you live it, when you play, there's no problem because the music is just part of the whole thing. My music is the spiritual expression of what I am, my faith, my knowledge, my being. John Coltrane. John yeah. Coltrane. Yeah. And the last word comes from pianist Bill Evans. Here's what he said. My creed for art is that it should enrich the soul. It should teach spirituality by showing a person a portion of himself that he would not discover otherwise. It's easy to rediscover a part of yourself, but through art, you can be shown a part of yourself you never knew existed. That's the real mission of art. The artist has to find something within himself that's universal and which he can put into terms that are communicable to other people. The magic of it, he says, is that art can communicate this to a person without his realizing it. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, how about a little bit more music before we wind up? We should do that, just uh, to let the music be an expression of all the words we've shared on the Spirit of Jazz podcast. Okay. Uh, here's a little bit of a tune I wrote, a uh, piano trio, and maybe in honor of Bill Evans. It's called Let Them Go, Set Them Free.
Thanks for listening to the Spirit of Jazz podcast. This is a production of Presby Bop Music. To find out more about Presby Bop, our music, concerts, and recordings, please explore our website at www.presbybop.com. And send us a note telling us what you think about the Spirit of Jazz. We'd love to hear from you. Check in with us again next time. I'm Jeff Kellum. And I'm Bill Carter. Thanks for tuning in.